Brad, welcome to the Sad Sung Podcast, man. How are you? I'm doing well, man. How are you? I'm doing really good. Really good. Awesome. Preparing good. for winter. Um, yeah, dude. So I've been seeing that you've been like super active on social media since uh, COVID hit. Um, and what is this? Uh, what's this thing been like for you? Because we, the last two shows we played before everything got shut down were with OAR. And we were talking with them that they were going to do a bunch of shows with you guys. And then their manager was talking to our manager. So I know that you guys were getting ready to gear up for something last spring and into the summer. Yeah. And then everything hit. So what have you been doing since then? Man, the, uh, the timing has been, at least in my personal life, has been really, uh, really sweet. My wife and I were just married uh, a year ago. Our anniversary is in a week. So we're cool. coming up on one year together and we go back, we got engaged in October, married in the end of November, got pregnant in January and then COVID hits, you know, like in early March and we had to cancel our honeymoon and we canceled our honeymoon and came up toward you. We went up to Coeur d'Alene where uh, Lisa's family's from and spent 10, we 10 weeks there instead of one week um, and just so fell in love with the area while we were, you know, sheltering in place in an Airbnb, um, <laughs> we got, st we got stuck in a house on a lake. Talk about a good place to get stuck. Um, but it was equally heartbreaking thinking how many people, what percentage of the world that's enduring this very same reality is not feeling like it's landing well for them personally or professionally. They're not landing in a house on a lake. Um, so we, Lisa and I have been able to be very grateful for the first year of our marriage for the two of us to just have to lean into each other so much more than if we were still leading our independent lives. Um, and then also for me to be there for the pregnancy, uh, our first child, and, and now to be able, he's our little guy's name is Amos. He's seven weeks old and we've been able to just focus in so much on him. So I'm really grateful, you know, my spirit is, is full because of what's gone on in my family. Um, but professionally, politically, and just feeling um, the, the grief and anguish in the world. Oh man, I wonder, do you, do you feel that? I feel like the artist community in large part, we have antenna to, to feel a lot from our communities and surroundings and also kind of absorbing energy from the world um it's just such a sad uh frustrating time um the one also that i'm i'm hopeful gives a lot that there's going to be a harvest in the future a harvest of wisdom and gratefulness hopefully a lot of us emerge from this uh wanting to live differently instead of returning to the old way and for artists sake hopefully there's a lot for us to uh, to build with a lot, a lot of new songs, a lot of new art that'll come from it. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, it's hard cause I too, am in a really blessed place where, I mean, financially I'm secure. Um, you know, and the COVID thing was, was really a blessing for me too. Cause we have a baby that's two and a half and, you know, when I was getting ready to leave next spring, we were looking at a nuts. So spring and summer, you know, like nonstop. And, um, you know, around that time was when my son had just started talking and I'm a stay at home dad when I'm home. So we were just like really connecting and he was kind of starting to favor me. And like, I was just mm -hmm. like, man, I don't know if I'm ready to leave. Like, you know, you just that window from newborn to five, mm -hmm. it's so small and it's like so much development happens there. And so I've been really I mean, obviously I'm not grateful for a global pandemic, but like you're saying personally for me and my personal life, it has been the biggest blessing just because for six years, you know, my family has just kind of had to deal with me going at a hundred percent, you know, and really right. being home for like little two and three week windows here and there, you right. know, as, as I built this thing and, and really it just got to a self-sustaining place where just because of residuals, I don't, 
you know, obviously that money from touring is nice, but it's not a necessity for our family to thrive. So the timing of it for me was just like, I don't know, man, I've used it as a gift. Um, and, have, and, been, and I have two stepkids that I've been with since they were very, very tiny. One's a freshman and one's a junior. And I've been trying to really um, uh, pass on to them, like how important it is that they, as crazy as this is, that they soak it all up. Because I'm like, man, when you guys have grandkids, they're going to ask you about 2020. They're going to ask you about this entire period and what it was like. So like, you know, just trying to get them in the state of, uh, of presence to really soak it up too, you know, cause it's just such a, such a weird time, you know? Um, so I've, I've been listening to dispatch for fuck since 2001, maybe nice, you know, like a really, really long time. And, and one of my best friends in high school was, like a super fan, like when you guys did the like kind of farewell show in Boston, he drove from Des Moines, Iowa to Boston straight through so he could be in the front. So he was one, he was one of those dudes in the very front when you guys did that, that big outdoor show in Boston. Um, That's awesome. So tell me kind of the story of Dispatch because I don't know, you know, so much of my knowing of the band was pre- social media you know where it's not like how it is now where pretty much any band you listen to now their story is pretty readily available um, right so how did you guys form and start and i always joke that you guys are the biggest band that no one's ever heard of i love that dude because <laughs> <laughs> it's like i think that i think was, that's kind of a trophy i really do it's um, the coolest thing in the world man we have you know i think when you tell people at least I've had kind of a funny experience with mentioning to people, yeah, I'm a musician or they've heard I'm a musician and I tell them, you know, our band name and they'll either go, oh, that's really cool. Like, do you, uh, do you ever play shows? Or they'll say, oh, I've been <laughs> listening to you for 20 years and I've come to, you know, 68 shows. And so uh, we met in college. Uh, we went to Middlebury College, Chad and Pete and I uh, in the late nineties and made music uh in the same way that you know we were just we were all three of us were athletes we played different sports and i think getting together the three of us to play guitar and sing kind of felt like another little team thing you know it was just a fun thing to do with some buds and small you know liberal arts school in new england is connected to lots of other small liberal arts schools and prep schools so once we had enough songs together to uh, thoroughly annoy our hallmates and uh, the people on our campus we would go and play at Dartmouth or we would go and play at Hotchkiss or you know we just had friends that were scattered throughout New England um, and I think we kind of accidentally became a little touring entity just jumped in our van and went on weekends to play shows and um, the end of our first year of kind of making music we recorded our our first album but thought that we were just going to kind of capture the end of something and have it for our friends and family. And we really liked the recording process and thought that the album was um, like, maybe it's a doorway instead of a, you know, an ending, maybe it's a, a gateway. So made some more noise the next year and recorded our second album and then started seeing people for the second time that would show up at a show mm -hmm. and went, I think, I think that's a fan. I think that person <laughs> right there, I've seen him twice. So uh, a really organic, fun way to be, you know, 19, 20, 21, and starting to kind of like stretch your wings out a little bit and figure out who you are and what your earliest songs were written about. And um, also just the brotherhood that Chad and Pete and I had was so uh, big, I think, in that season of life. You know, we're all trying to figure out really who we are and where we're wanting to go and then how to do that collectively well. Um, that's the tension that sinks bands and it's also the tension that makes us fly. I mean, trying to collectively share a, a statement or a song or a microphone or the spotlight or an interview. I mean, it, it takes a lot to get your egos to uh, create space for each other. and. So I'm not, we, we did it for six or seven years full on. And then 
I think because we hadn't made enough space for each other and probably just the stage of life that we were in, it's like we had to really push each other away and we were so burned out, not sure if we wanted to make any more music, not sure if the van life was for us. And just as we were, you know, uh, getting ready to go on hiatus, this thing called Napster emerged. And <laughs> we had that. one show. So we played almost everything on the East Coast. And then we were invited to play a college gig in, in um, I think it was in Santa Cruz. We, we flew straight out to California. And there were more, more people there than any of our East Coast shows. And they were like three quarters of them were singing the lyrics. We were so confused. We're jet lagged. We flew through the night. I mean, we felt like we were getting punked. I don't think that TV show was around yet. But yeah. We, felt like we were like, how is this possible? Who are these people? How do they know our songs? Why are there so many of them? And at the end of the show, we asked like the student activities coordinator and he's like, oh, you haven't heard of Napster? We thought, at least I did. When, when, when I heard that, I thought Napster was the name of one of our biggest fans. I thought there was this dude at this college in California nicknamed Napster. That was just handing like, your shit out. <laughs> totally. That had blown us up. Uh, so very quickly, I realized that was not the case. And Napster was a real thing, kind of an underground radio source. And we didn't realize how great the timing was for, I would say, the song, The General, uh, that we're best known for. It landed as Napster was landing and somehow we were on one of the earlier waves where I think a lot of people heard our music. Uh, didn't cure up the burnout though, but we were pretty stoked. Uh, but we went on a, a hiatus from 2002 to 2004, got back together to play what was to be our farewell show because truthfully we still weren't in a place, I think spiritually where we were ready to be, you know, a three headed thing going forward. Um, and we sent an email out to people saying whoever's coming in from the furthest distance will do a backstage hang, thinking that it was all going to be domestic. Um, and within like two or three weeks, 29 different countries were saying, you know, like fans from 29 different countries were saying we're coming. And we were like, what is this? Like, what is going on? And we played our free show in Boston in a place that holds like, it's an open field that holds 22,000 people. I think that's what the permit was for. And the estimate was like 100,000 or 150,000 people showed up and kind of shut down Boston and Storo Drive and was just this epic monumental day. The most beautiful weather, everyone showed up, uh, the vibe of free music and us looking out. And we played like a four hour show, uh, not feeling like we had spent any energy because there was so much in front of us. And then we kind of went in our different directions and then played one more show in 2007, a benefit for Zimbabwe. Something similar happened again, where uh, we had one night at Madison Square Garden that we thought was really gonna be a, a huge reach. And all of us were really risking thinking, well, I hope this works. Uh, if it doesn't, I'm not sure how we scale it down. And the first show sold out and we added a second, it sold out, we added a third and it sold out. So that was really special, not just because of selling it out, but the African Children's Choir came and opened up and then sang with us. And we had four three and a half minute vignettes that we had created in Zimbabwe, interviewing some of our friends there. And that was up on the Jumbotrons. And we really felt like the whole night was um, geared toward like the idea that we belong to one another and look at what we can learn from people in Zimbabwe and look how we in New York City can help the country that in that moment was the poorest and most impoverished uh, in the world. So again, really heart filling, um, but we still didn't want to play full time. So we went back into obscurity, played again in 2010 and then went, all right, this is so stupid. We get together to rehearse for a freaking month to play one show. It's not even that fun. <laughs> so 2011, we uh, went on tour and, you know, kind of dipped our toes carefully in touring again, but weren't writing yet because of the wounds of, you know, 10 or 11 years before where we're like, let's just not write anymore. Let's not be a band anymore. There's too many things that we're not agreeing on. Uh, and in 2011, it felt really good to play again. The tour went great. We recorded some the, the next year. And then from that point until now, 
we've actually been more, a lot of people still think that we don't exist uh, and that we broke up and have gone away. But in reality, from 2011 to today, we're like twice as prolific as we were in the first seven years. So it's been yeah, a and as a, as a, a as stops a, and starts. As a fan of your guys' music, um, the, the records that you've made since, you know, that initial bump uh, have just continued to get better. Um, and it's, it's cool too, to see a band just as a fan of music in general, where you have like, um, your early records really held this vibe of like, oh man, I could see this like bang, bang. That whole record is like, dude, I, this could be in a living room right here. Like with just some friends, like drinking beer, hanging out in a vibe. But you're like, it also held this thing of like, no, I would go see this in a concert and could see also doing this with a shitload of people here. And then as your, uh, as your records progressed, um, you know, location 12, um, was really the soundtrack of our of summer tour of that year for me. I just was like on this constant repeat of like, there was just something about it. Like, especially that song, Wild Ones. It was just like the kind of this weird floaty, ethereal soundtrack for like, what are we even doing? We're just like floating around and making art and playing it for people. And it just, it kind of fit the vibe perfectly for where we we're at in our career at that point. Um, dude, I gotta ask how the hell do you play a show in front of 150,000 people, sell out three nights at Madison Square Garden, and then be like, all right, guys, I think we should still take a break. Like any other logical band would be like, oh, okay, well, if this is our reach, not, and, and I mean, obviously there's the like playing in front of people is like the most amazing thing in the world, but also from a financial place of just being like, oh, we could scale this, go do one three month tour and coast for, you know, question mark, like, yeah, there, I, th I think the quickest answer is Chad and Pete and I, if you're empty and it's not working and your spirit for some reason is not really aligned with what is happening in your group, even when you're positioned and doing something really special, mm -hmm. we could acknowledge how special the, those moments were and still do a pretty deep heart check and be like, all right, for the sake of our friendships and for the sake of what we hope is our longevity, it's not right. It's still not right. We can try to cash out and then we'll be resentful. We can try to squeeze more energy out of us, but we're each empty. We can try to, you know, I think honestly, we had heard enough stories of bands that winked at each other on stage and smiled and had jokes and even kind of like the rehearsed hugs walking on stage and walking off that hated each other off stage. Mm -hmm. And we were like, fuck that. That is just like, we do not want to be those guys. And we really wanted to try to hold our brotherhood in a way that the business wouldn't get in the way and it always does um and i'm not sure i bet if we went back we'd try a thousand different ways to continue to protect our friendships when the reality is like here we are today chad and i are still playing and our brother pete who's foundational to the band and a dear friend and a, a soulmate he's not in the band now because of mental health issues and because of, you know, just the reality of a 25 year toll of living life on the road and the decisions that we've each had to make, you know, is this sustainable and good? And, but it really, Chad and I've, you know, even in the last month, because we're releasing a new album now, we've had some interviews where we've gone back and remembered. And we do both think that we're making music now because we didn't keep going in 04 and 07. It would, I mean, it's such a funny deal, right? In some ways, I wish that we could go back and uh, in 2004, it was a free show. And in 2007, it was hundred percent benefit to Zimbabwe. And we played in front of, you know, almost 200,000 people between those two shows and i'm kind of thinking now like what i wouldn't give if we had five bucks from each person as a ticket <laughs> as an artist to where right now i'd have some stability i mean i'm on unemployment 
and so is my wife and we're not touring this year we're not likely going to tour next year i mean it just depends we'll see what happens but we're planning for you know not touring for a while and dispatch has massive loyalty and family and fan connection and the influence and support of being a part of our family is incredible beyond any paycheck but dad and a husband now I do think a lot more like it'd be interesting to process your question if we played MSG tomorrow would it yeah. be a hundred percent for Zimbabwe I might say 90 or 80 yeah. sure if we were playing that show in Boston I might say hey wouldn't a free show also feel pretty free even if it was five bucks or ten bucks or we had a suggested donation and so you know always trying to balance the season of life that you're in how you feel relationally about your bandmates and what you're really thinking are you playing the long arc and making hard decisions short term to hopefully set yourself up for more in the future or are you kind of going for the, the quick grab not too sure what is going to come well it's really respectable um because you see bands like especially you know in the 70s like some of the bands are talking about i watched this documentary about the eagles mm. and have Case you seen in that point. dude in oh, the talk gosh. back mic where glenn fry is like literally talking about kicking his friend's ass after the show. And then they like go and play hotel California right after he's just like, I'm going to hit you in the face as soon as we get off stage, you know, it's just like, Whoa, bro. You know? And to, I guess a, to have the sense that it wasn't right and that you didn't want to fake it, you know, money's cool, but to not make fake music or put on fake performances is, you know, I have, when my grandfather was dying, I wasn't really close with him, but he, would, he was sitting in this chair, you know, for the last probably three years of his life. And I had one good conversation with him. And he was essentially saying, you know, it's made this whole philosophy for me called the chair philosophy. What am I going to think and feel when I'm sitting in my chair? Um, and he just kind of imparted. That's a good line, man. Is that his that, song? No, no, I should put it in one, huh? <laughs> Uncle. that sounded really good yeah because he um you know he just was imparting on me like bro when when it when it comes to your time and you're sitting in this chair all you'll have is your memories and your thoughts and reflecting on decisions that you made and making the right decisions and getting everything off of your bucket list and knowing that you approached everything with honesty and integrity it makes the chair a hell of a lot more comfortable mm. um and um you know, I just, I think of that all of the time. So that's really respectable to me um, that you guys made that decision when you could have went out and, and, and did the cash grab, but knew that your friendships wouldn't really survive it. Listen, it sounds prettier and wiser now. We were close. We were so close. We had, we met with every record label, you know, in 2001, I bet, and had blank checks across the board with people who were just, made us feel like hey we can't wait for you to be the next so-and-so mm -hmm. and they would always quote you know who is it dave matthews band or vertical horizon or i mean they had so many you know pearl jam they had so many different bands that they're like we'll just make you into what these other bands have done with successful paths and we just never felt like we were that comfortable with the people who were in front of us so i'm grateful somehow we realized money is just energy. And if you take a shit ton of money in the wrong way, you just brought a lot of bad energy into your world. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, you just kept yourself from some of that toxicity and who knows, betting on hearts and betting on teammates and betting on um, trust, humility, trying to build into things where you actually would enjoy being around the people that you're around. We, uh, we've left a lot of money on the table, but I would say that we've had some of the most incredible tours with crew members who keep coming back and a family that's developed and, you know, connecting with fans during service projects. And there have been some summers where there's, you know, a, a, a pretty solid paycheck, but nothing that we can really, 
bank away. Nothing where you're like, yep. okay, now I'm set for five years. But dude, in this day and age to get to pursue anything that is art, that is healing you in that in the process of even writing it and performing it. And then the venues we get to play, you know it. Like the yeah. the, the the feeling is be, is beyond currency. The feeling is beyond something yeah. that you could. Yeah, a hundred percent. And like you're saying, when you see people, you know, I remember the first festival we played. We just had, you know, I would say 2018 was our first festival season. You know, when you have those like later afternoon slots, and you, you know, you hearing that in the background. Yeah, it's not loud though. Okay. Just tell me if you want me to go inside. Okay. Um, Where it's like, um, you're wondering if anyone's going to be at your festival set. Cause you're like, okay, well I know there's 10,000 people here. Hey, hang on a second. I can see him coming around the corner. We can start this one over again. Sorry about that. No worries. Such a nice day. 72 degrees here in Colorado today. Yeah. We just got outdoor a little office. All right, we'll go to a darker and quieter place. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll sit at the drums. That'll feel good. Nice. All right, mate. Yeah, so the, it's really crazy the, you know, the the energetic currency, if you will, of, you know, you have this feeling or this idea that you write down into a notebook. And I feel like sometimes when I write, no, not sometimes, all the time when I write, I'm never thinking about anybody else. I'm like trying to capture whatever feeling or like thing that I'm working through. And, you know, it was like just last festival season, we would get these late afternoon sets and be like, fuck, is anybody going to watch us? Like, we know there's thousands of people here, but there's three other things happening right now. And we would like, you know, it'd be 10 minutes to our time and we'd see, oh shit, that is a lot of people. And then you start having the game of like, well, maybe they're just here because the other bands playing suck or, you know, like whatever the thing is. And then we started having that where we'd go out and looking out and it being daytime where you can see everybody and they're singing your songs back to you. And, you know, I just started sitting with that really heavy on drives of like, oh man, this isn't about even making a living. Like this is about something so much bigger than me. Yeah. Or anyone else in this van, like to, to write something down and capture a feeling or a moment and feel like it's just you in this little world. And then you take it out to the world at large and go, whoa, this connected with all of these people and they're feeling it too. Um, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's way more important than, than, than financial security or stability, you know? It's like, totally. like you're saying, like most people, and it's something that I think of all the time when we're on the road, is it's like most people don't like their jobs and most people put up with their jobs because they see, okay, well, dispatch is coming here on March 18th. That's four months away and I'm getting my ticket now. Hmm. And I work this job that I tolerate so I can get my money so I can go experience this. So it really kind of taught me a on the road that good day, bad day, whatever. I have to push my shit aside because like people are hunting magic and people like you and I just get to live in the magic like we're just constantly pursuing it and stewing in it rather than having to be like oh i'm gonna go seek this out you know right um, yeah and, and part of it too is just uh where, oh so last week i did like a zoom class for seniors in, in a high school class that were like pursuing high level art whatever it was some were dancers some were photographers musicians painters and one of the questions that came my way, I was like, oh my gosh, it, I mean, brilliant. A 17 year old is sending this to me. Hey, if you pursue your passion and it becomes your job, how do you keep it your passion? Or do you now need a new passion to take a break from the old one? And I was like, oh, 
I mean, <laughs> the magic you're talking about is entirely real, but it doesn't matter what magic or lack thereof people have in their life. Anything that becomes monotonous, mm -hmm. anything that you kind of like get used to over and over and over and over again, it is so hard to um, appreciate it for what it is, to still feel the magic, so to speak, and not you know, live in the thrill is gone idea. So I think, you know, being on tour and, and connecting with people and being like deep, deep, deep gratefulness. Wow. I can't believe the freedom that is in my life that I'm healthy enough, connected enough with other musicians in a place where we can freely travel in a place where people have enough money to even value music look at those people who are in the front row look at the people who are singing along like trying to find a way to connect with that catalytic spark so that you finish a show thinking about magic as opposed to you know how easy it is yep. like oh dang we were the venue was only three quarters full yep oh shit we had a horrible sound check oh the bus yep. ride last night i didn't sleep or i just got a call from our managers that are song isn't quote selling like come on man like to get yep. beyond that stuff and connect meaningfully with even one fan that says you know your music helped me get through last month when i lost my dad or yep. your music is helping me deal with a job i can't stand i mean yeah that is that is beyond currency i like this theme somehow that yeah we're talking about yeah totally the, the, the real the real currency that we that we're living for well, it's interesting, man. Let me ask you this. So we have a, one song in particular called I Am. I almost didn't put it on a record. Just felt too personal and weird to share. And it is, it's one of those ones where we, right when we start playing it, everybody starts cheering. Like sometimes I'm like, I'm scared to play it too early in the set because I don't want people to leave. You know, where they're, I'm like, okay, they're like, okay, cool. I heard the song. I'm out. Mm -hmm. um, and I got really tired of it for a while. And then my kind of like my perception on it shifted because I saw the exchange that happened when we played it and it made me fall in love with the song that I was completely tired of playing. What's it like for you guys 20, 20 years deep on, or I guess 13 years deep or no, fuck, we're over 20 years, 25 years on like, like a song like The General or anything from Bang Bang where it's like, you know, you're going to play this fucking song. You've been playing it for 25 years, but you know, people are going to freak, you know? We're just super lucky that that landed on the general or bang, 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 bang is so much fun to play because every single night, the, the musicality of it is different. So whenever yeah. we play that tune, I'm not thinking so much about the lyrical meaning in it. I'm just loving how open and, we will play it fast, slow, we'll take big breaks, we'll do extended solos. It just, every night is fun to jump on the playground of a song that's that um, flexible and a song that you know that well. The general, um, it still gives me chills and tears, exactly the same as it did 25 years oh, ago. I love because that. Because the message is timeless. Enough war, yep. enough violence enough exchange of life for something that when you're on the other side, you never would have exchanged your life for. So I think to create a piece of art that grows in significance, the older we get, and now that I'm a dad. It... There, we're good. My Bose phones are going whack. Okay, I got there you. we go. Um, Chad's a dad with three kiddos. I'm a new dad. Um, it's just becoming more and more significant. The idea of like, we have got to wage peace. We have got to put the same energy that we would into if we had joined a military, put that into waging places of agreement and places of, you know, um, spiritual valuing of each other, even apart from our differences. You know, if an artist can stand somewhere in the middle and be a unifier, and if there's a piece of their art that can unify people in a deeper place than what the surface disagreements are, I think that's one of the most 
profound places uh, for artists to stand and for their art to stand. I don't, I bet there are, I'd love to know what percentage of Republicans and Democrats sing uh, the general each night. Well, it's interesting that you say that, dude, because I think, you know, I remember, you know, people used to make me play it in high school, you know, when we were at fires and shit like that, you know, because I was always the guy with the guitar. And, you know, my brother got in some trouble in 2002 and was approached by an army recruiter around that same time and was like, well, if you agree to join the service and join the infantry, you know, I can go in front of the judge and speak on your behalf and say, well, he wants to go actively serve his country. He said he'd go to Iraq. Um, and um, it was just really crazy because when I would play this song, I would see everybody like it was just like this song being played at a party. And every time I played it, I was just like, I wanted to like throttle people like, but do you hear the fucking song? Like, are you past the chords and how fun it is to sing the chorus along? Like, are you, do you get it? <laughs> you know? Um, and I, I think that's always what's been really special to me about your band is that you guys have always um, done a good job of drawing everybody in where it's like, oh yeah, anyone can listen to this music. And then you had certain songs. And I felt that way with state radio too, where it was like this very listenable music that was um, that was far beyond surface level and was talking about really important things. Um, how did you guys, was it like a conscious decision for you guys to uh, to be so vocal and to, to have activism so interwoven into your thing that you built? Because since I've been aware of the band, that's just always been, you know, it was always like, oh yeah, they're giving all this money to Zimbabwe or, oh, you know, this song is actually about this. and. I bet, I mean, geez, I, that'd be a really interesting one. If we went back through our, you know, our catalog, I don't, I think the general may have been, uh, was definitely the loudest activist song, but couched in such a fun, like you mentioned, the, the music is so fun that I think the music would capture people and the, the, the delivery of the lyric and the melody would capture people before the lyrics hit on what this song is really about. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, part of the reason the three of us, I think, needed to break apart to then come back together every three years, to then come back together more fully, is each of us had a different thing, a different well that we would go to that fired us up, that we were super engaged with in terms of our songwriting. and activism and political division, let's say, um, has just become increasingly important for Chad and I to address. And I mean, we don't need to write songs like we did in our early 20s yeah. about questions we had then. Our questions now are from a position of being dads and being you know, in our mid forties and thinking about legacy and what are we going to be giving to our kids and our kids' kids and wow, we're white. Wow, we're white men. Wow, we're white men that grew up in these amazing zip codes. Wow, look at the access that we thought was normal for every person in our country within, you know, a, to a degree. And wait a minute, look at the privilege that we have lived in how can we um, turn the light on even brighter to where we see how underprivileged and how stacked the scales are against people with different skin color, different zip codes, different um, last names, different languages they speak, different, there's just so many things that uh, the older you get, the more aware you become we're so grateful for the path that we've had, but I mean, like music is a way for us to hopefully be increasingly political without getting stuck in partisan politics. Yeah. Like, yeah. is there a way to draw people? Like I've never, I've never seen, and I'm still in the midst of it. I am trying, I'm not usually an angry person and mm -hmm. I am, there's a, a, a lot of anger in me the last couple of months watching the, I mean the last couple of years watching Trump lead our country watching 
how deeply my like CNN and Fox, let's just say, yep. how they have gone as far right and left as the political groups have. And there's just nothing presented in the middle anymore. And have you watched the, the movie, The Social Dilemma? Yeah, yeah. And that movie's incredible. Thinking, well, what if the enemy is this self-selecting uh, it is. It is, so man. The smartphone that we have that's making the conservatives go further that way and making the, quote, liberals go further that way. And before long, we don't have any dialogue in the middle. We just think the other party is an enemy and completely out of their minds. Yeah. So I'm I'm really blessed. Um, I'm really active in the mixed martial arts community. I do Brazilian jiu-jitsu and I teach. Um, you know, we train people to fight in the cage and the, the sport and I've just grown these kind of alliances all over the country um, with different fighters and different camps. And there's a lot of conservatives involved in the sport. And I was amazed, you know, so when, when, when Trump was elected, I made an album called Culture. I turned down a record deal and I, and I self-funded it because I didn't want anybody else's hands in it because it was a concept album about... 2016 to 2017 so you know i poured almost 40 grand into this album and still to this day nobody listens to it and it was a it was a gut check for me because i was like okay i feel this thing brewing i'm gonna make this soundtrack for it now and this it, it will be able to serve a movement and a cause um here in the next couple years and, and we released the album and it really fell on deaf ears and it was a really big uh, emotional hit for me because I put so much into it. And now I've, I've come to a place with it is there's the like, as a dad, there's the, you know, that the famous old um, James Baldwin thing where the where kid says, you know, at some point my kid's going to ask me, daddy, what did you do when the shit was going down? And I'm going to be like, well, I made this timestamp, you know, I made 11 songs that were pretty much all geared towards you know, my perspective on this thing. Um, how have you guys dealt with the, uh, you know, the kind of shut up and dribble thing of just like, hey man, just sing songs. It's not, you know, you don't, it's not your place to comment on all this shit. Like, what do you know? Um, <laughs> we try to figure out the right, the right forum and venue to even uh, go there with our fans. Every now and then something that we'll put up in, our social media turns into this shitstorm. I've seen some comment threads. And we're like, oh my gosh. And then we watch our fans go back and forth and ultimately like when a forest fire is burning, don't jump in it. Yep. I mean, just, That's let, a good just idea. let it go. There's so much. It's not the right time or place. Well, and outside um, of the internet, like that. So that's what I was going to get at with the with the mixed martial arts thing. Is I've I've met a lot of conservatives, and when I talk to them, the things they're concerned about are the same things that you and I would be concerned about. Right. right. And their their ideas are millimeters away from probably your and I's. And I've met so many conservatives that I'm like, oh, okay, well, I've been because of my little curated world in here, yeah. I thought that if you were a conservative that you were like in favor of white supremacy and yada, yada, all these, yeah. all these very extreme things. And, right. and especially in the last year, I've, I've come to realize I'm very, very close with a couple people that are very conservative. And we've been able to have these very open conversations Oh, that's so good. Yeah, man. Where it's just like, okay, well, yeah, that, but what about this? And they're like, okay, well, this, but what about that? Um, right. and, and I really tried to do that with the podcast too, is just having people with different takes. You know, I have a friend that's a, that's a Green Beret um, and an Army Ranger. And he was talking about his struggle when Obama went into office and they cut all this military funding. He's like, well, yeah, but then I'm in a third world country and I'm seeing terrorist organizations move down a mountain, uh, oppress people in ways that are unimaginable, like, right. you know, unimaginable to an American citizen. Right. And I go, you know, to SOCOM and I say, hey, here's the weaponry I need. Here's the team I need. And we can stop them right now before they get into Syria and take over a city and put all of these people in a Sharia law lockdown, you know, and 
you know, or castrating people in the street, like real crazy thing. And he was like, under the Obama administration, I would go and they'd be like, well, we can give you a third of that. So he's like, then I'm forced in this situation where I'm like, okay, am I going to risk the life of my best friends to try to stop these evil people? Or do I let these evil people go about their business because I know that we can't defeat them? And it was a perspective that I never thought on because I had always been very, very much under the belief that if we reallocate this military spending, right. we put it into education or put it into these other things, that that would make the world a better place. But to right. hear the perspective of a Green Beret, he's saying, well, but that's not actually how it goes. Um, Do you know what I would love? Uh, it, when we emerge from kind of the COVID cave, I think the most powerful thing that we could do is make music, but then kind of instead of service projects beforehand, almost like town hall gatherings. Yes. We have got to figure out, Chad and I would, talking in person, or, or let's say a fan that threw this horrible thing up on Facebook, for example, I'm making this up. Yep. I can't believe what you guys stand for. I can't believe the song you just put out, the video. Da, 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 da. If we could get into a room and talk for 10 or 15 minutes, I am genuinely curious. I want to know your perspective and I want to know why. And I'm going to try so hard to not personalize this. I want to be curious. If our country could grow in our ability to be curious and want to learn and grow and understand each other's shared perspectives because we genuinely do believe we're a community, we belong to each other, this is the time to hit the pause button. We've got to figure out what you said. Oh my gosh, we're not, you know, a thousand miles apart. Yeah. We're only a couple steps apart and a handshake and let me actively listen to you for 15 minutes to say that is a really interesting perspective. If you don't mind, may I share mine? Yes. We walk away from that feeling like we are stronger together. We are wiser together. My blind spot is a little bit smaller now that I know what you see. Your blind spot is smaller now that you know what I see. Uh, well, so I think the, the venue of the exchange is so important. And social media, ironically, you know, our phones, our smartphones are making us dumbasses uh -huh. and, and dividing us like crazy with that curated self-selecting news feed that we don't even know is happening. And then we think our best forum of influence is sound bites with each other, you know, just kind of lobbing rocks at each other. So some, why don't you and I have an ongoing conversation about this and try to engage more of our artist community around it as well that yeah i love that learning how to dialogue and learning mm -hmm. how to listen to each other is way more important than anything else that we yeah do well there country. has to be there has to be the the magic of uh fighting is that it is so uh or martial arts is that it's so absolute and it's so hard uh to train that there's this level of respect going in that it's like, okay, well, even if we don't have all of this in common, we're in this kind of secret society together. So we have yeah. this form of respect. That's it's the end of the deeper. Yes. And it's like, um, or you know, sorry, that's uniquely deep, uniquely deep. Yeah. And, um, and I think music is, it, it, if not more powerful, you know, if you have a bunch of, you know, at one of your shows at one of my shows, one of our shows where it's like, well, we're all here together, so we have this in common. It had that in my experience. That's where it must start. Is okay. Well, you have a son. I also have a son. Um, you know, you're concerned about this. Well, I'm all, I'm also concerned about that. You know, and and if we can start with the the not lobbing rocks of like, oh, well, you have a different idea than you mean. Then you're this. If you say you don't like grapes, then that means you love oranges and. You know, now we're all, we're already we're already spinning out of control. You know, it's like if we can start with this is what we do agree on. Now let's calmly and and, and safely and securely kind of back away from what we do agree on and into things we might not. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think I think that's the thing. People got to learn how to talk to each other again. Um, and that is, you know, it's the beauty of living in a small town. Is um, you know, I'm blessed to live in a place. You know, I lived in Chicago for many years. 
and people don't really make eye contact on the street. You know, they don't nod at each other. They don't wave when they're driving. Um, and the place I live in now um, is very much that way. It's like if you were on the side of the road with a flat tire, you wouldn't be there for more than five minutes, you know? Yeah, that's so good. Yeah, and that's that's kind of what we're missing, especially with COVID, because people are locked inside, right? And what do they have? They have their phones and their computers. Yeah, so. I mean, it's a perfect storm. It's mm -hmm. wild. Coming into the election, I was like, are you kidding me? You cannot create a, a movie script. I know, I know. This. I know. And it's like when uh, we need to be talking. We're in our homes looking at our phones, making yep. the forest fire hotter, yep. perceiving it to be bigger than it is. Like, and look what it's doing to families, look what it's doing to community groups. I mean, oh, yeah. when we come out of this, we need to learn how to to find those places of unique depth where we agree first and we are, yep. dude, you have white in your eyes. You have a smile. Mm -hmm. Our blood flows red. You have kids. I have kids. We Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting too, because there's, um, you know, the media, I feel like has lost, there used to be a responsibility to just share what was happening, right? Here is what is happening in the world. That's it. That's all I'm here to share with you. And their game now is create panic and chaos, concern, fear. And I was just having this conversation with my wife. I went into Billings to grocery shop yesterday and I was like, dude, the fucking toilet paper at Costco is almost gone. And my wife was like, yeah, I saw like seven articles about that, you know? And I'm like, well, if they would quit writing articles telling people that we're going to run out of toilet paper, people would not fucking think we were going to run out of toilet paper. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. they're just like poke this bear. And then they're like, oh my God, the bear's attacking someone. Take pictures, you know? So yeah, it's just this like this self-feeding thing where they tell everyone that chaos is ensuing. So they believe chaos is ensuing and then chaos ensues. And then they comment on the chaos ensuing. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, all I wanted was Biden to win, to remove Trump. Mm -hmm. And then now that Biden's in, all I want to do is dismantle the two party system. Yeah. And call CNN and, as if I have any. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but my dream is, is right. that journalism, journalism would become journalism again and that the news would become the news again. And we wouldn't have, a freaking global pandemic, which could have unified our country. Every people group feels so unified when they have a common enemy. Mm -hmm. And thank God this common enemy isn't in the Middle East or in Russia or a people group. We had a chance to not be Republicans and Democrats, but mm -hmm. to be Americans and humans that cared for each other and cared for the world and were faced with the enemy of a pandemic. And instead, politics splinter, media splinters, and then you've got people arguing over whether or not masks work or don't right. work. <laughs> Are you kidding me? If this is an airborne disease, people, wear a freaking mask. And if yep. that's the hardest thing you have to face in your life, be grateful that you're not a part of the other 4 billion people in the world who would say wearing a mask is a privilege and the easiest thing to do in the world. Yep. It is like, this is... To me, a maturity check on our country and a humility check on our country. Oh, wow, we're that selfish and we're that entitled that this is, how dare you infringe on my rights? Yeah, and like, that's, it's on. funny, that's the exact stance that I took on it too, was it was like, what a, what a thing, dude, of just like, yes, if you are in a store or around a bunch of other people to wear a mask, that that is that's the government dropping its, uh, you know, tyrannical hammer on you. And yeah, um, here comes communism. Yeah, man. And it's so crazy. And then, you know, on the other side, it was like, uh, I deleted my Facebook and, and it was funny because I deleted it. And then two weeks later, the social dilemma came out and I was like, fuck, I feel really good about that decision. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, uh, one of the last things that I saw was when the polls started coming out, this lady, uh, that's a Facebook friend wrote, you know, uh, it's sad to see that half of the country supports Trump. I did not know that 
50% of Americans were white supremacists. And I was like, in my head, I'm like, dude, that it's a little more nuanced than that. We can't just say that half of Americans totally. are, are, are white supremacists. And then one of the yeah. comments on the thread was uh, her friend, one of her friends saying, well, I have a friend in Australia and she's being told that they shouldn't travel to the United States due to the growing threat of violence. And we pretty much live in Iraq now. And I was just like, you know, this was like on the far left side of the craziness. And I was like, well, you've clearly fucking never been to Iraq, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. having, having, you know, half, we just forget how misinformed people can be. And then unless they've heard yeah. all of the information, you know, we can't just say if someone voted for Trump that they're a white supremacist, because it's like, maybe they didn't have access to the same information you do. Yeah. Maybe the only way they get their news is looking at their phone on the train <coughs> to work. You know, so it's like, it's so nuanced and it's uh, the, the state of privilege in this country, you know, with people making the decision of, well, well, well masks don't fucking work anyway. It's like, yeah, dude, they've just been used in the medical field, you know, for 300 right. years for shits and giggles, you know, like. Well, and just simply to view it, hey, even if there was a question and we weren't sure if this was going to work the pros and cons of this how does that play out well if i wear it and it does work and i'm not a dot connecting other dots to the point where someone dies of this disease i put others ahead of myself if i don't wear it and it turns out that that thing could have been protective now i am a part of this sad trajectory where the dominoes are falling Because it continues to come back to what informs us. Um, but I do, I, I'm just saddened to think that we are becoming so increasingly fed by media and so not fed by connecting with each other that yeah. we're, just, we're drifting and drifting and drifting apart when the best thing that could probably happen to our world would be a little solar flare to knock out our technology. Yeah. Yeah. Just allow us to belong bit. to each other again and realize that like I've had the benefit of, again, because of skin color, zip code, family, um, everything in my life. I ended up in Nicaragua in 2005 through a faith community, working with kids in an orphanage found a trash dump filled with kids and families that were living there, discovered something I'd never seen in my whole life, did not know that there were townships of kids living inside landfills and scavenging for recyclables to eke out their existence. And I found it when I was probably at the highest point in my career and the lowest point in my spiritual um, health. I mean, I just felt so lost and I genuinely believe my, the way that God drew me into this community, the way that community in their miserable poverty reflected back to me what spiritual wealth could look like in their eyes, in their smile, what they offered me, it completely changed my perspective Outside of that particular story in Nicaragua, I've traveled to 40 or 50 countries. Now, if you juxtapose that experience and privilege with someone who has not been born into a scenario where they can travel the world and have perspective from lots of different cultures, or even your friend who is a Green Beret, I mean, we need each other. We need to know what is it like to be in Central America right now with Hurricane Iota hitting Nicaragua. I'm, I, I'm going to spend the day reaching out to my friends saying, what's going on in Nicaragua? How can I help? And how can I be a communicator to other people who listen to me, how they can help? In the same way that if an earthquake hit in Nepal and you had family there, you'd personalize it for me. You'd send me a text and say, dude, this thing hit home so powerfully for me. Would you mind sharing with your f friends, family, and you know network what I'm seeing? So I think there's just, we have got to be um, more connected to each other than we are kind of like 
connected by IV to these huge um, media groups that are so filtering our news. And the more human we are with each other, the more we can say, actually, have you been there? You keep demonizing the Middle East. Have you been there? I've only been there once, but I went in 2009 and it rocked me. And now I at least have the ability to say to friends when the conversation starts moving in the direction of stereotyping people who live in the Middle East, stereotyping terrorist groups, stereotyping political dynamics. Hey, have you been there? Just asking the question, hey, have you been there? Is an activist's way of checking where a conversation can go. Yeah. And if they say, if people are able to say, you know, I haven't been there it, for the moment, just in a moment that all of a sudden you've changed the dynamic on, well, maybe you're not a hundred percent right. And maybe you're regurgitating something that someone else has weaponized. Who also probably been hasn't there. been there. <laughs> yeah. I met that person. Or do you have black friends? Yep. Do you have native American friends? Do you have Muslim friends? Do you have gay friends? Do you have transgender friends? Do you like, oh, stop yeah, judging each other and not knowing each other. Know people yep. and then start connecting with them and then start adding your humble perspective to what could be instead of saying emphatically, this is what is. Yeah, man, it's, it's, it's crazy to use Nepal as an, as an example because I went there you know, it was that ultimately it was the trip that made me decide that I wanted to pursue music. But when I went there, there were so many things that I had never, you know, I had a very rough upbringing, but there were things that I'd never considered being able to drink out of a tap, being not having to walk two miles to retrieve my water. Um, and the people in the Himalaya are full of joy. It's, um, it seems to be like the general goal is to be as pleasant and upbeat as possible. Mm-hmm. And I remember I had just gotten to this little village called Namche. I was like, you know, a week into my trip. And we had just crossed this river and I'd reached down and touched because it was this crazy like baby blue and it was all glacier melt. And I touched it and was just in awe of how cold it was. You know, it was probably 35 degrees. And we get further up this hill and I'm watching this dude wash his nuts in this water and give himself a bath in this water. And when I came around the hill, he gave me the most cheerful wave, big smile on his face and was like, man, if this guy can smile, washing himself in 35, 40 degree water, you know, doesn't even know what a warm shower is. It's just not something Mm -hmm. that he's ever, he's ever experienced. It's like, man, it made me think so hard about the perspective of people from this country and America has always done a really good job of inserting herself and her opinion into everything of this is right. This is wrong. We are the civilized ones. And this is this. Mm -hmm. And while we've obtained this amazing quality of life, it is, it's altered the perspective of, of the citizens so hard. Cause like you're saying, it's like, you've never even had to think about where you're going to get your drinking water. Like that kind of negates you from talking about, world poverty, you know, like if you, you know, or if you've never witnessed it with your own eyes and helped someone retrieve that water, it's hard for you to have an opinion on it, you know? Yeah. And, you know, unfortunately we can't give everybody. And like you're saying, that's why I think these, these, that town hall idea is so great because it allows that perspective to be given from somebody with firsthand knowledge rather than the media conglomerate, which is, okay, this is the approved opinion that we're going with. Okay. It right. goes to here. And now we give it to the guy that can deliver it most, <clears throat> most emphatically. Yep. You know, and I think our job would be to curate that space and to hold that space. Um, I love the fact that like, I don't, I don't even remember when it was, but when I was old enough to declare, am I a Republican or a Democrat? I was like, Oh, what's that box that says independent. Oh, mm-hmm. thank God. Yeah, 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 100%. Like, oh my gosh. Why on earth aren't more people so active and excited to just check a box that says, I'm actually not affiliated with either. I'm going to think and feel and weigh each time there's an election that comes around, each time there's something that's in front of me. Somehow, I mean, and listen, I'm still going to blow it because every human has a bias, but we need... 
there need to be more middle ground livers, middle ground seekers, middle ground holders, and people who are more interested in curating a space than being right. And if we can curate a space that says we are going to be stronger if we hear each other out instead of, hey, we're going to be stronger if you get my opinion because it's right. I think it would be so incredible what we would learn. And then I, God, I would so hope that we could do that with other cultures. And I would hope we could do that with other religious groups and other, you know, um, just whatever category you want to come up with, whatever stereotype you want to come up with, as soon as you are talking with the quote other and realizing how much you do share in common as humans. Oh, it's so inspiring. And so, so very profound. Yeah, such a better place to start than, you know, listening to things that you disagree with, you know. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you about um, Calling All Crows because we um, recently got linked up with them. And I did some acoustic shows in Colorado a couple months ago. um, And we've been in touch uh, pretty regularly. And the plan is to have them at every single show moving forward. Um, uh, So... Talk about how you calling all crows and here for the music and like how that started and what inspired it. And, you know, I'm, I can give my perspective on it, but Chad is the founder of calling all crows and he knows kind of the, the more detailed um, background on it and what the current vision is for the future. But calling all crows Dispatch, every time we've gone on tour, at least for the last like eight or nine years, Calling All Crows has come to activate our service projects. And Kim Warnick, who is the executive director, um, is a dear friend. And I feel like I've learned so much from her on all kinds of perspectives. I mean, she's just one of those um, generous and wise souls that's kind of giving herself to learning the real stories that are out there and what we can do to to serve and uplift people. Um, But Calling All Crows, particularly in here for the music, um, just looking at how much um, sexual harassment there is in the music industry and in live shows and in a space where it's a, it's a party, it's a, it's a paid party and how um, women are often treated and how they feel in that environment. And they've done some survey work uh, just to get a sense as to how, what do people, what do women really feel like when they're at a show? What are women feeling kind of vulnerable to? What's annoying to them? What is way more than annoying and is actually um, offen- offensive and criminal? And then <clears throat> how do the venues respond? And how do the bands respond? And how can we create a space that's still free and so much fun and you know, still a party? but a really respectful one uh, where women aren't, you know, treated as, uh, as objects and you can grope them and the lights go down and you get near, I mean, any number of things. So here for the music is in large part about going into venues and training up the staff and training people to have a policy in place and, you know, a way for any fan who feels uncomfortable or all the way up to reporting you know, um, <clears throat> being harassed or being taken advantage of in uh, a way that would be criminal. Like, how does a fan, <clears throat> excuse me, how does a fan start the process of sh- sharing with people and getting safe? And also the person who is making them feel unsafe, what does the staff and venue do about that? Um, so they call it active bystander training. And um, as bandmates, we've gone through it. And in our service projects, we're also helping people to just think about that space and to make sure that everyone who's there is having a really good time and no one feels like they're, you know, kind of at risk. Um, Calling All Crows also over the years, I think has uh, championed a particular story for several years at a time, activated the bands that are on tour to help fundraise for it and raise awareness. I remember when um, they were working with women in the developing world who just by giving them like a stove, a small stove, all of a sudden those particular women and families would be able to better provide for their kids and for their communities. Um, Chad and his wife Sybil have worked a lot with Oxfam and um, I know that they have partnered quite a bit, but Calling All Crows is just a really um, awesome network of 
of folks who are saying, hey, bands, any of you who are on tour, if you want support, we're here to support where your heart is naturally breaking in the world or what you're an activist for or what you want to accomplish with the, the social reward of being on tour and then they'll activate it. So I'm really grateful that you've done shows and that you're affiliated with them and that you're inviting them to help kind of uh, multiply whatever it is that you're really about. Yeah. You know, I've worked uh, with an organization called unlikely heroes now for a few years and they, it's crazy, man. They're like a, uh, an all woman SWAT team that goes to these third world countries and they raid brothels and save young women from the sex trade. And what's really special about unlikely heroes to me is I'm a big fan of things where you can see is recidivism, the right word, where you see mm -hmm. people that have been helped by a program, then in turn be like, okay, well, <clears throat> I'm going to give my life to this program because it saved my life. So they rescue these young women from the sex trade. They get them in school. They help them kind of like self-actualize outside of this environment and go, okay, well, yeah. what do you want to do? Which has never even been a question that's been posed to them before. And then they have all these safe houses, you know, where they get them learning and in school. And what ends up happening is most of them go, well, I want to help rescue girls. Right. So it's just this thing that keeps compounding and compounding. But, you know, as far as wanting to get involved with here for the music, you know, I've had a couple instances at shows where I've stopped playing to address someone and essentially shame them out of the building. Just seeing them wanting to dance with a girl, the girl making it clear she yep. didn't want to dance with them with hand gestures and you know, you can read somebody's body language yep. and then persisting and then just stopping the band and being like, hey dude, you have to leave now. And if you don't, I will get off the stage and I'll help you leave and you don't want me to help you leave. So just go. And for me, I always saw the reaction of that from fans and then would get flooded with messages from females being like, fuck man, that has never happened before. A band has never stopped playing to address that. So mm. to see that there's an organization uh, you know, that has an answer to it besides hop off stage and kick somebody in the head. It's like, you know, I was really, really yeah. open, open to that. And, and I think of just putting the signs up around the venues, uh, whether it's female seeing a sign uh, and reading it and, and being like, oh, cool. Well, they're curating a safe space or it's yeah, dudes right. seeing it and going, oh, people are watching. I can't be a douchebag. Yep. You know, yep. it's a kind of cool uh, double-edged activist sword. Um, so yeah, they're, they're turning on the light, you know, without turning on the light. It's so good. Yeah. Yeah. I'm grateful for it. Well, dude, I have some standard questions that I ask every musician that I have on the podcast and then, uh, and then I can cut you loose. Cheers, man. All right. So what is your favorite band that you have played or toured with? Favorite band that we have played or toured with. Man, I'd have to say uh, when we played with Nako and Medicine for the People, we had the most um, spiritual connection I think we'd had with a band. Tim Snyder, particularly their violin player. He's all um, over our new well. record. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, then I'm. Yeah, he, he is someone I I hope to be in touch with until I'm done and in my chair. He's yeah. just one of the sweetest humans and. We felt that way about a number of those guys and just had a really great vibe. Ray Zaragoza was a part of that tour and had an incredible connection with, with her as well. And, you know, I know there's plenty of controversy surrounding Nako's actions and how he's treated women in uh, recent years. Um, and that's been a really important thing, I think, to be brought into the light. But I will say their band culture in large part uh, and the experience that we had on tour with them was just a really, um, it was a, a really heart filling time. It, we, there was a lot of good that we accomplished together. Yeah. They all had, uh, had raving reviews of the experience. We played like four or five festivals with them and, you know, Nako and I, at one point, especially when I was getting started, we're, we're, we're fairly close. Um, we had like two summers in a row where I'd play on a Friday, he'd play on a Sunday, I'd play a Saturday, he'd play on a Sunday. And, and I'm good friends with everybody in that band as well, particularly Tim, you know, he's played on so many of our records. Um, but he, um, 
you know, we got with that summer that you guys were on tour, we, we got to play three or four festivals with them. And I was, you know, that was my first thing was, dude, what's it like touring with Dispatch? What are they like? And they were all like, you know, they told us the story of you guys taking them to Pine Ridge and being like, no, you have to come. And um, yeah, dude. Yeah, the feelings are definitely reciprocated from everybody in that camp. So I'm sure they would all answer, answer that question the same way. Um, what was the first record or song that made you cry? Wow, dude, these are good questions. <laughs> <laughs> testing a, a, a dad with no sleep, testing his brain. Um, first record that made me cry. All right, this is a reach. Simple Minds was the first album that, I mean, I think I was in fourth grade to give you an idea. And I was at some wilderness camp thing for like three days and the cool counselor had the Simple Minds tape. And I listened to that Simple Minds tape uh, and I just, I, I lost, I mean, if you can lose it in fourth grade before you even know that you're playing and you're like, I knew I loved singing when I was yeah. a little kid. Yeah. But something in that Alive and Kicking is their kind of hit song from back then. There were a couple of others. But the sound and how lush it was and how emotional it was, like I was, I'm not sure if I cried, but I was transfixed. I can remember having my Walkman on and just being in a whole nother world. And I could hear their British accents too. So there was something foreign about it. Yeah. But um, it really, yeah, it was... Simple Minds. What did, I, never, what did I say? You said did simple, I say Simple Minds? Yeah. Okay, good. I was like, did I just call it the wrong thing? No. No, that, yeah, that that's the right. first tape that really had me transfixed as a kid. And I think put me on track to have a really deep connection with music. Well, to, co to compound that, what was the first record or even band that made you go, man, fuck, I want to do this? You know, like, I want to... Really? Yeah, I went and saw ACDC two times front row in these big shows. And so, all right, let's make the move. Fourth grade is Simple Minds. Maybe the first time there's kind of this connectivity between music flowing into you and how charged up you can feel and emotionally you can feel. Then go to eighth and ninth grade where you're like Rah! trying to figure out who you are and you see this massive heartbeat and the pounding music and the lights and all the excitement, Angus Young playing guitar. I mean, ACDC is what really got me thinking, what would it be like to be on that stage? Yeah. Ooh, that's great. Yeah. It's so funny how different it is. You know, I remember, uh, for me, it was, uh, when Garth Brooks and it would have been like 1993, did his big, uh, it was the first time that it, there had been like a professional video production of a giant show. And I remember we, we videotaped it on VHS and I must've watched it all the time. You know, he fucking coming down from wires on the rafter playing his guitar. And I was just like, whoa, man, it'd what be really it? cool to be that guy, <laughs> you know? <laughs> totally. Um, what's your favorite hip hop album of all time? Favorite hip hop album. We're going back. It's Run DMC from probably seventh grade. And it was was Walk This Way on it with Aerosmith. I think I think they had collaborated together yep. on that song. Yep, cool video too. So, yeah, I remember um, learning how to beatbox against it. I would just sit there and work on, you know, lip rhythms way before I became a drummer. So f just so funny to think how what was brought out of you before you realized what you were drawn to as a musician. Yeah, yeah, it's weird the stuff that triggers it. What, it's called Raising uh, Hell, right? Run yep. DMC, Raising Hell. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I remember that video very vividly because I remember it's like, it looks like a Run DMC video and then they like kick down this brick wall and Steven Tyler and Joe Perry came out <laughs> and he does his verse. So cool. That's right. Um, and it kind of made, I feel like that was like the beginning of the like, uh, you know, and Rock's then like the over. next version was like Anthrax and Public Enemy. Yeah. You know, oh man, so cool. Um, so what cool. are what are three records that you're really in love with right now or three bands that you're listening to a lot right now? Um, there's an Icelandic singer, a guy named Asgir, A-S-G-E-I-R. His voice is unbelievable. And the production behind him is so cinematic. So it's 
it's kind of my happy place music and my emotional space music. Anytime uh, my wife and I listen to Oz Gear, it's just amazing. I mean, it's so colorful and so beautiful. Um, what else as far as new music? I mean, I would honestly, I would just push people in the direction of Ray Zaragoza. I yep. think her new record is really great. And I know who she is as a person. And I really believe in the trajectory of her artwork and her heart. Uh, Mark Sibelia is another friend of mine. He's a singer songwriter in Nashville and his record just came out. And I think Mark is a strange talent. I don't think there are that many. Well, my perspective is I don't think, I can't think of very many people I know who are just as good at piano as they are at guitar, as they are at singing yeah as they are kind of self-producing and he's actually crossed over and has done he's been kind of the the voice uh that a handful of hip-hop uh artists have invited into their work mm -hmm. and he's got some song in germany that has like a quintillion downloads you know I'm, he's just a, a jack of all trades artist with a brilliant heart so yeah mark sabilia ray zaragoza and asgir I love it. Um, well, I'll leave you with uh, the record that I'm currently listening to. Chris Stapleton just released a new record. Nice. And it's, uh, it's really good. And it's really typically when an artist gets that big, it's like every record kind of gets bigger and bigger. And this record is literally a drum kit, a bass, um, and him playing a jazz master through a Princeton. And it's, uh, it's cool to see an artist that big just play this simple thing. You can tell he played all, all the solos, you know, there's no like cool. Nashville hitters in there. It's just like this really yeah. simple dude just writes such amazing songs, man. Right on, right on. Well, cool, man. Well, I really appreciate you taking time. Like I said, uh, I'm a huge fan of, uh, of not just Dispatch's music, but um, the way you guys have moved through your career and, and, and put, um, such integrity and service into everything that you do and it, and it means a lot um because that's always something that i inspired or aspired to do uh as an artist so it's cool to see that there is there's a pathway into uh into integrating activism and humanness into into art um and i and i can't wait to hear you guys next record and i, I really hope we can get together and play sometime yeah man that'd be great and listen i'd be remiss um, the nonprofit that I founded in 2007 is called Love, Light, and Melody. And we're, we've been doing work with that group of kids in that trash dump uh, mm -hmm. in Nicaragua since 2005 is the first time that I went there. Um, this next year, 2021, is a really exciting year for us. We have been working on, the short story is, I met a little girl named Ileana in the trash dump. She completely made it real for me. I couldn't believe a 13 year old could smile in the midst of a living hell. And she died in 2011 just because she was vulnerable to every dark force you can imagine in that trash dump. And her sister passed away and they were literally, they had become like family to me. From 2011 to current, we've been trying to figure out how to honor their legacy. Uh, and we've been building a documentary film called Ileana's Smile that will come out first quarter of next year. And we've also fundraised enough to build a school in their honor. So Ileana School of Hope is an elementary school uh, that we're building into that trash dump community. So for anyone that's interested in learning uh, a story that is tragic, but that will inspire you and lift your spirits, that will teach you about another culture, that will show you that spiritual wealth might just be bigger than physical wealth, I think there's so much that we can learn um, from walking with Ileana and walking with this group of kids that have made a trash dump look like heaven. So all of that will come out in 2021 and um, our website hosts tons of pictures and the film trailer currently. And we're also going <clears> to <throat> have a soundtrack where it's collaborative with other artists, original music inspired by Ileana's life and smile. Um, and we would love to have you a part of it. Why not oh, you man, I'd be it, honored. Watch it and see what you have a conversation with, with your wife and as parents looking at these kids and you as an artist, I would love for you 
without me um, commissioning you, I would love for you to, what is it that resonates for you and what would you write to be a part of a soundtrack <clears throat> that's going to raise funds to endow that school and moving forward? I love that, man. I'd be honored. Love, light, and melody. Love, light, and melody, man. Maybe the next time we connect, we can go a little deeper on it. Yeah, I would love that, man. I would love that. Awesome. Well, God bless you and your wife and your new little baby. And um, let's, keep in, wide, let's keep in touch, man. Bro, are you kidding me? I know your hometown. <laughs> I drive through your hometown to get to where we're moving to. Like you and I were meant to know each other. And I agree. Make I some music and keep these important conversations moving forward. Well, if you're coming through and, uh, and, and you want to take a stop in, uh, in the little Norman Rockwell town, man, you're always welcome here. So let me know. Done. We got the best fish tacos I think we've ever had at the end of Main Mas Street. Moss Taco. Um, that's it. Yep. That's it. I couldn't figure out what the name was. That's yep. it. Good, man. Well, Chill yeah. Dude, Let's talk you. soon. Yeah. yeah. Honored Thanks to have this. you. Honored. Cheers, bud. Talk soon. Take, yep. Take care.